the things that we have to take consideration everything so with no more delay i would like to uh, hand over this to biprojit to introduce uh, dr mr pillai who has contributed his life uh, uh, towards these two tragedies so he has been a, in legislative part with respect to with respect to science where he has done lot of research i mean like where he has found solutions and currently he is in a um, uh, he is in an industry where he is letting it reach to the end user so uh, i think he he will be the appropriate uh, person to inaugurate uh, this uh, uh, lecture series now over to you biprojit uh, and uh, i would uh, request you to introduce dr mr pillai thank you one and all yeah am i audible yes you are audible okay so hello everyone thank you so much for being here this evening and today we have a very special guest right from kochi kerala and he is none other than dr mr pillai and he is a renowned a uh, ready pharmaceutical scientist with over 40 years of research experience and he obtained his uh, bachelor's from kerala university masters and phd from university of bombay and dsc from the institute of nuclear chemistry and technology poland he worked as the head um, uh, of ready pharmaceutical division bhava atomic research center during 2002 2003 and uh, 2013 and uh, he was at different times during uh, university of missouri as a postdoctoral research associate uh, visiting professor there and he also worked at the international atomic energy agency iea during uh, 2003 to 2010 and i think he was engaged as a group director at molecular cyclotron uh, kochi and uh, dr pillai uh, carried out extensive research in the ready you know essay also being called as the ready you know essay men of india and uh, he is also expert in radiological production and radiological chemistry uh, he has uh, he is expert in radiological production using both reactor and cyclotron and he has authored over 200 publications including 30 review articles he even holds two us patents and presented over 100 invited lectures and he has authored three books at the iee he was responsible for editing and publication of 13 iee Books. and he would have, um, uh, would have read those books like uh, cyclotron produce radio nucleides technetium for pharmaceuticals and more books and uh, he has visited uh, more than 50 countries in connection to his iea work and he received six iea awards including the swiss service award merit award and two team awards and two best publication award during his seven year tenure so these uh, his biography is very exhaustive so i cannot have all of them uh, so without making any more delay i would request dr somendrana troy to say you words and then we shall begin over to dr roy dr roy you are muted hello can you hear me sir you are audible clearly sir okay uh, good evening everybody uh, thank you viprojit and good evening dr pillai sir how are you i am showman from calcutta thank you thank you so much nice meeting nice seeing you yeah it's nice meeting you after a long time now i am the hod in uk medicine at tata medical center kolkata and oh yeah rakesh biprojit and any others were my students when they had done their msc nuclear medicine which was a joint iit kharagpur and msc uh, tmc tata medical center course so uh, um uh, it is our proud privilege to have uh, dr mr like us uh, viprojit has quite nicely introduced him he is a stalwart in this field in the field of radio pharmacy so i will not waste much time and uh, i shall like sir to share his experience in radio pharmacy and his thoughts in radio pharmacy with us and at the outset i will also like to thank uh, uh, 
Rakesh. Rakesh has done a splendid job in organizing this and creating this academic platform, which will be immensely beneficial not only for the students but also for uh, the uh, technologists, radio pharmacists, scientists, clinical nuclear medicine specialists, whoever is working in this field and who will like to join uh, in this series of lectures where scholars like Dr. Pillai, Dr. Ramamurti and many others uh, will be uh, talking to us and will be sharing their uh, thoughts uh, in the respective areas. Thank you Rakesh, you have done a splendid job, keep it up and over to Dr. Emar Pillai. I'll share my screen. Let me. Am I audible? Yes, sir, you are audible clearly and your screen is also visible, sir. You can start, sir. Okay. Thank, okay. You, sir. Thank you, Dr. Salman Ray. It was a very kind of you to tell those uh, nice words. We are friends for uh, such a long time. And I'm also very happy to know that, you know, you are mentoring these uh, extremely intelligent, good students. As you know, Biprojit uh, is working with us and he is really turning out to be a very nice uh, asset to us. And uh, my thanks to Rakesh. Rakesh, you are doing a wonderful job in organizing this uh, training, this uh, seminar series. And uh, this is not only good for the students who are um, attending this seminar. I'm, I'm sure some of this will be recorded and uh, this will be available as uh, teaching materials to the people who are in the field and the generation which is going to come. And thank you Biprojit for um, inducing me into this uh, lecture series program. And I'm also honored to be the first speaker and in, uh, the inaugural speaker in this uh, function. Uh, thank you very much. This I consider it as a great, a great privilege. Thank you. So, can I, I will uh, now start with my talk. Uh, Biprojit yes, had uh, informed me that, you know, this series of uh, lectures is there and whether I will be able to take one of this lecture. I said, yes, of course. Um, then he had suggested this title, Radio Pharmaceuticals and uh, Nuclear Medicine. And um, he also gave me the contents what I should uh, speak about it. So these are the three things which he told me to speak on his history of radiochemistry and its role in nuclear medicine. The second thing he wanted me to talk to was on radio pharmaceuticals and methods of labeling. And the third and last is actually about the project what I am currently involved after my retirement from BRC at the, in uh, 2013. And uh, how much time I have uh, Biprojit or Akash? Now it is 8.20. Yes, sir. Uh, one more hour, sir. One hour uh, we have, actually. Maybe yes. we will not take that much. Yes. So I will start with the milestones in uh, radiochemistry and uh, nuclear medicine. Of course, uh, this can be discussed in uh, different ways by different people. Everybody will have their own uh, version and everybody will feel, you know, which is more important to be told, which is more important not to be told and which is important to be suppressed. So this is what I have prepared and um, of course all of us will start with the discovery of radioactivity by Henry Bakurel in uh, 1896. That was one of the epoch making uh, discovery that some materials spontaneously emit radioactivity and this was followed by the discovery of radium by Mary and Pierre Curie. They isolated uh, radium chloride in, in the year 1898. And uh, this was uh, followed by all the three of them getting the Nobel Prize for uh, Physics. Becquerel got uh, half the Nobel Prize and uh, Mary and Pierre Curie got uh, the remaining half. That means one fourth uh, each. And uh, it was also in the year 1910 when they, they decided they, the, they decided to have a unit for radioactivity. You know, you, you know that there is a a French firm which will IUPAC or uh, IUPAC which gives uh, this naming 
and uh, curie was uh, given as the unit for radioactivity and this was a this a defi <coughs> defined as the amount of radiation which is coming from 1 gram of radium 226 hence the isolation of radium was needed so Marie Curie was uh, <coughs> succeeded in uh, isolating radium and polonium from pitch blunt pure materials of radium was there pol polonium was there polonium was uh, named after Poland because Marie Curie was from Poland and in the year 1912, I think Marie Curie got her uh, second Nobel Prize. This was this time it was in chemistry. That is for the isolation of pure radium and polonium. So Marie Curie remains one of the four persons who has got Nobel Prize uh, twice. And she got in both in physics and chemistry. Now, the moment radium was uh, discovered, the radium was isolated. There was a lot of thinking that, you know, this will be a wonderful medicine. This medicine can is a cure for every disease. You know, there were a lot of medicines which were prepared uh, by using uh, radium-226. They, they thought that this can treat anything, you know, from syphilis to whatever common uh, cold. So in 1913, Frederick Porcher reported the injection of radium for therapy of various diseases. So this can be considered as the first attempt for uh, nuclear medicine or radioactive radiopharmaceutical uh, Medicine, of course, that was a big failure because injecting an alpha particle emitting radioisotope to the patients was one of the big mistake which was done and probably many people would have got unnecessary exposure at that time. Now, you have heard about George de Hevesse. He was one of the Hungarian scientists who worked at different places like in Vienna, Copenhagen, Sweden, different places and he was interested in make, using radioactivity as a tracer. So he is a pioneer in uh, all the tracer studies and he did a wonderful study on injection of bismuth 2110 which is a radioactive isotope of bismuth in rabbits. And his uh, idea was to see how fast the blood is getting rejuvenated or how fast this um, the, uh, the metabolism uh, works inside the body. This was followed in 1934 by uh, Irene and Joliet Curie reported the artificial radioactivity by nuclear reaction. This is an epoch making discovery because, you know, thus far, you know, we knew a sort of uh, people called alchemists. They were telling that, you know, lead can be converted to gold, but they, that all turned out to be simply false. And uh, conversion of aluminum to phosphorus 30 by Mary and uh, by Irene Curie and Joliet Curie in 1934 was a very good discovery. This was the first artificial radioactivity. What they did is that they used the polonium which is coming from which was isolated by Mary Curie. The alpha particles were coming and uh, impinged on aluminum, um, aluminum and they found that even after removal of your polonium, there is a residual amount of radioactivity present there. And both uh, Joliet Curie and Irene Curie got the Nobel Prize. And uh, with this, Curie family is the only family which has got four Nobel Prizes. And in the, together with all of them, they got five Nobel Prizes in their family. One of the very nice invention in the early, in 1930, was the idea of cyclotron by Ernest Orlando Lawrence. You know, that was the time when all the fundamental particles were, were getting uh, discovered, the nucleus by Rutherford, the neutron by Chadwick and proton and the electron, everything was getting discovered. And they were studying the atomic structure. The atomic structure can be nicely studied by using the X-rays. But when you want to study the nuclear structure, the wavelength of the X-rays is too large. So you need particles which have the wavelength which is matching to that of the nucleus. So this was the time when the linear accelerators were uh, being built. You know, Lawrence was uh, in that project only really, where the linear accelerators were, uh, were being developed. And he immediately understood that, you know, if you want to make a linear accelerator which can... Uh, uh, accelerate the particles such as a charged particle to high energies, the electrode length will increase, keep on increasing as the time, as the voltage increases. So 
he had a wonderful idea why not you apply a magnetic field to the the charged particle and once you have the magnetic field applied the charged particle will bend and after bending you can probably keep it in a circular fashion and that will be good enough so you are you can have an accelerator which can be placed inside a room rather than the accelerator going from meters to meters as you know one of the accelerator has a length of 3.2 kilometers the accelerator in california laboratory a linear accelerator has a length of 3.2 kilometers which is a very large for an experiment so the cyclotron was one of the very good uh, invention in the 1930s and at the time actually um, uh, lawrence was hardly about uh, 31 years you know the good ideas come to all the youngsters and not to the oldies you know so all my students who are attending this uh, classes think about it you are all the people who should uh, bring new ideas to nuclear medicine Uh, at the time also if you anything is made if you can find a medical application the funding will be better then uh, lawrence says induced his brother john lawrence who was a physician uh, to use some of the isotopes what he was making it you know what had happened he said you know when the particles were accelerated and impinged on some targets everything became radioactive they started isolating those radioactivity and one of the first isotope was actually p32 and uh, lawrence brother uh, john lawrence took this isotope and uh, tried to treat it to treat patients who are having leukemia that is uh, the, the disease called polycythemia vera and of course it worked very well so this is the, definitely the first starting of the nuclear medicine therapy and uh, followed this was by glen seberg and john living good Uh, made id in 131 in uh, using the cyclotron itself and uh, in 1946 immediately after the war was over the second world war was over there were lot of um, you know the, all the reactors you know the reactor which was made for uh, making plutonium that was available so everybody's attention uh, turned to can we use this radio can we use this reactor the reactor for making medical radio isotopes So in 1946, this person called Samuel Seidlin and his colleagues used iodine-131 for the treatment of thyroid cancer. Now we are in 1921. Nearly for about 75 years, iodine-131 ablation therapy is the best one for treating thyroid cancer. Thyroid cancer is one cancer which can be very nicely treated. Very nicely treated. what the doctors do or what uh, they is that they remove the thyroid and they will ablate the remaining um, uh, uh, tissues thyroid tissues by giving a large dose some anywhere between 30 to 200 millicurie of iodine 131 and that patients can live as uh, cancer free for the lifetime so in the history i have also put some of the events what was happening in india because the history and our our introduction to nuclear energy our introduction to atomic energy our introduction to nuclear medicine also i have sort of put it this was one of the we got um, <coughs> independence in 1947 and immediately after independence uh, atomic energy commission was constituted with homi jahangir baba as the chairman that was just a year after that actually immediately after the in 1947 august we got the independence and in january 1948 baba homi jahangir baba submitted the first draft for making this atomic energy commission then it was constituted somewhere in august 1940 august or september 1948 so we sort of entered into this nuclear era or atomic era in 1948 starting uh, that was the seed which was uh, planted there now in 1950 benedict cassen developed the rectilinear scanner see the need the, though iodine 131 was first used for uh, iodine therapy for cancer therapy they also thought that this can be used for uh, seeing how much is the uptake iodine uptake can be done it and what they used to do was that they used to use a probe maybe a geiger probe or a scintillation probe they used to use it to measure it 
then this gentleman uh, uh, benedict cassen he developed this rectilinear scanner this was nothing but you have the, the radiation probe which was moving in the x and y directions and wherever the radioactivity was more it used to tap the paper with more pressure actually so the first imaging i will not say it as the imaging the one it is the scanner was developed by uh, benedict cassel and um, 1950 there was another important uh, development in nuclear medicine as you know the all the nuclear medicine or most of the early nuclear medicine studies had come from the, the developments had come from the brookhaven national laboratory this was thanks to the commissioning of the graphite moderator reactor at uh, the brookhaven national laboratory so they had a very good reactor and they started making lot of isotopes and all these isotopes were available with them they started developing radioactive medicines so within 6 years we had our apsara reactor commissioned at prombe that was in 1956 imagine the first reactor in the I mean united states first uh, research reactor in the united states had come in 1950 50 and within 6 uh, years our reactor apsara reactor was commissioned at prompe and this was of course uh, <coughs> thanks to hobi jahangir baba this uh, apsara reactor uh, commission they began critical on 4th august 1956 this is the reactor uh, uh, vessel this is a, a pool type reactor where uh, the person can climb and see there is a um, water um, light water is there and enriched uranium is there and uh, this was the first reactor in india which was uh, used for the production of uh, radio isotopes and it will be very appropriate to talk about it how we were able to do this wonderful uh, thing within 6 years we have to talk about uh, homi jahangir baba homi jahangir baba was an young man in 1939 he was hardly about um, 30 years he was work he had worked in the uk he is from a rich parsi family his father wanted him to become an engineer then he agreed for that and after getting his engineering degree in uk he said to his father that you know i want to do physics he started doing physics and he has discovered some of the fundamental particles fundamental research he has done there is something what is called a baba scattering and uh, one of the very bright uh, bright person he has published actually single author paper in the journal nature you know nature is the best journal in the world and he has published single author paper uh, in journal in uh, nature at the age of 26 or 25 or 26 he came back to india in 1939 maybe for a vacation but after he had come to in india the second world war had started and there could be no longer ships were not available to go back to uk all the ships were engaged in the war war supplies only so that was the time then he started working at the institute of science in um, bangalore then uh, coming from a rich parsi family he could uh, influence the jrd tata to tell that he should start a institute for fundamental research that is how the tata institute of fundamental research started and it started actually in the ancestral home of homi jahangir baba i think that so that was started somewhere in 1945 and immediately after um, um, after the world war was over and india got freedom and he had lot of access with our first prime minister uh, pandit uh, jawarlal nehru and the thanks to that association he could make this atomic energy commission in 1948 and he was the first chairman of the atomic energy commission and that time he was hardly about um, uh, he is born in 1909 so he was um, 38 or 39 years old only now this is the <coughs> view of our baba atomic research center this is the cyrus reactor and this is the druva reactor and uh, not only he dreamed about making institution he also dreamed that the inst- the people who are working in the institution should be well taken care of so he has also designed and that uh, said that you know our uh, housing colony should be also adjacent to the research center so we have a wonderful housing colony called the 
Anushakti Nagar and uh, he had a vision how the atomic energy program should uh, start in India and he knew that okay initially you are able to bring some of the experts from abroad but that will not sustain a program you have to start a training program right in Trombe. So the, he visualized what is called a DARC training school, Baba Atomic Training School. And this is a famous saying by him. When nuclear energy has been successfully applied for power production, in say a couple of decades from now, India will not have to look abroad for its experts, but will find them ready at home. That is his vision of uh, making the training school. As you know, most of the departments in India Many of the departments in India are headed by administrators. But Baba Atomic Research Center and Department of Atomic Energy is the only department which was never headed by a non-scientist. And of late, all the people who had become the chairman of atomic energy, starting with um, uh, Kakotkar, um, <coughs> Energy, uh, Dr. Ba Dr. Kakotkar, Dr. Energy, Dr. Sinha, Dr. Basu, all of them are from some uh, from training school batch. You know, Kakotkar was the first one to become from the training school. He was from the seventh batch, and uh, this is our uh, new training school uh, complex. With that, I will uh, go back to the milestone of radiochemistry and uh, nuclear medicine. Uh, in 1957, Hal Anger developed the gamma camera. You know what is the difference between a rectilinear scan and a gamma camera? You have a large crystal and you have multiple photo <coughs> multiplier tubes. You are uh, you, you take several photo multiplier tubes and uh, trying to collect the information what is coming from a single sodium iodide crystal. This gamma camera was developed by Hal Anger. But uh, not many people were interested in it because it uh, there was no use. But that was the time when Powell uh, Richardson and his group from uh, Brookhaven National Laboratory developed this molybdenum technetium generator. You know, this is a wonderful concept. You cannot ship long-lived, uh, short-lived isotopes to hospitals. You need a long-lived parents. This They called it as a molybdenum technetium cow so that you can milk the technetium out of it. Nowadays, we call it as a molybdenum technetium generator only. So this was one of the very good developments. And the parallel to that, of course, uh, the BRC commissioned uh, a better reactor in uh, 1961. We call it as the, Cyrus, the BRC commissioned the Cyrus reactor. And by that time, we had a good isotope division working there. You know, Baba has brought one of the um, person from UK, I think his name was uh, Dr. Taylor, and he, started, he was heading the radioisotope program at that time, and he started making isotopes in the Apsara reactor and continued with uh, the Cyrus reactor, and uh, he has also induced uh, good uh, younger people at that time, Dr. Raya had joined, and my own uh, boss, Dr. Mani had joined, and few others have joined into the isotope program, and they were the one to take the mantle forward. So we started, India started our program of 1961, uh, BRC commissioned the Cyrus reactor, supply of radioisotopes and radiopharmaceuticals. And in uh, 1963, the first liver, uh, first scanning of, uh, first use of uh, the 140 kV gamma rays coming from uh, a technetium was used. Somebody, what they did was, Sorensen, what he did was, it, he took molybdate, molybdate and injected it to patients. And this molybdate got absorbed in the liver and it decayed it to technetium. And the 140 kV gamma rays had come out. And using these gamma rays and the gamma camera, what was um, made by Hall Anger, they could make the do the first imaging imaging so this will call it as the imaging era in nuclear medicine has started in 1963 nearly about um, 20 to 25 years after the first usage of p32 for therapy this uh, in 1964 paul harper and lanthrop made the technetium tracers 
the first tracer what they used was actually nothing but uh, pertechnetate pertechnetate got uh, absorbed in thyroids and also it was useful for uh, imaging brain when where there was a blood brain barrier barrier damage they also made the um, complexes um, the colloid what is useful for the liver and in 1965 the first technetium um, scan was uh, reported by herbert et al they used the gamma camera and the pertechnetate and the, the the first medical scan using technetium was uh, then in 1965 and this starts the golden era of uh, nuclear medicine the availability of a generator the availability of uh, the camera called the gamma camera and different compounds made of technetium but one of the problem here was that you have to every time um, make the technetium complexes of uh, with the different ones and uh, do the radio labeling and uh, <coughs> a very nice development that happened again from the brookhaven national laboratory the richards that is the person who was discovered uh, uh, the group leader who developed the technetium molybdenum technetium generator and uh, eckelman they de developed the first cold kit what is the cold kit the cold kit contained actually the uh, the chelating agents in this case actually it was actually dtpa di di <coughs> diethylene triamine pentaacetic acid and they mix some stannous chloride to it and together this they called it as a cold kit and all what is needed is actually you need to add uh, the, the there was a buffer was also was added and you can make this kit and whenever you want to make the radio pharmaceutical just use the kit and you add the pentaacetate uh, coming out of the generator now mind it nearly 50 years all of us are were do doing this magnesium uh, radio pharmaceuticals thanks to this development by eckelman and richards eckelman was actually the editor of uh, journal of nuclear medicine for a very long time maybe you know ever since i knew his name he was editor of uh, nuclear medicine and biology or uh, before that it was called the ijari journal then uh, about couple of years back he has uh, given that work to somebody else a very nice gentleman one of the very senior scientists i am proud to say that i have met with met with him and interacted uh, with him see indians were uh, doing wonderful job in radio pharmaceuticals many uh, some of the bright uh, people had gone to the united states and one of them was actually mani subramanyam or gopal Sub mani subramanyam he was called mani subramanyam and he along with a person called mcafee they did the first mdp preparation that is technetium mdp and mcafee was a nuclear medicine physician or a radiology professor they did the mdp scanning now if you know what is mdp scanning earlier we used to say that this is the bread and butter of nuclear medicine of the scans which used to come to the nuclear medicine department was actually for bone scan and bone scan using a technetium mdp we were one of the very early people to start working the, uh, the i mean we means baba atomic research center was one of the early people to work in on the generator and the technetium called radio pharmaceuticals my entry into radio pharmaceutical division was in 1976 after the training school and at that time when i went there i was already finding my senior colleagues like narasimhan and ramurthy were working with the technetium generators and the kits so probably i feel that they would have started somewhere in 71 or 72 thanks to the wonderful leadership which was given by our great mentor who is called dr r s mani so the hospitals in the hospitals in india started getting at that time the number of nuclear medicine centers were very less the radiation medicine center was there and the radiation medicine center has already started the drm course and the dmrit course and the doctors when the technologies coming out of that they were going to different hospitals and setting up these nuclear medicine uh, <coughs> nuclear medicine um, departments there and if you know if you look there are lots and lots of nuclear medicine physicians who are, are trained at the radiation medicine center has headed uh, departments all over the world
see one of the interesting thing uh, what people want the nuclear medicine physician wanted to study at that time was uh, the brain imaging they thought that you know the brain in, if you want to do a brain imaging you need a molecule called the glucose because you know our brain works on glucose so in 1975 the brookhaven national laboratory again uh, by ido fowler and uh, walter uh, alfred wolf they synthesized uh, fdg for brain imaging and uh, this unfortunately what had happened is that they used the gamma camera to image the fdg of uh, the brain imaging but the image was actually very bad but parallel to that was actually the discovery or the invention of uh, not really, not really the invention you can say that you know the uh, coincidence, coincidence counting and uh, pet work had started maybe somewhere in the 60s the ending was actually by the development of the pet camera the positron emission tomography camera by michael turp pogosin pogosian at the washington university st louis missouri and uh, in 1976 uh, abbas alavi used fdg in two patients but that uh, as i told you the images were not good because they used gamma camera so most of the technetium radio pharmaceuticals were uh, developed during this uh, years uh, during this uh, formative years all the what they used to do is that they used to look at the shelf and see what all materials are there and uh, try to make a technetium complex like mdp was made dtp was made and in the mid 80s people started synthesizing very specific compounds for making uh, a technetium radio pharmaceuticals the person called david troutner he visualized that if you have a neutral complex it will get into the brain of course this was bad told by somebody then he took up this work and he made this 99 technetium hmpo which was the first brain imaging agent this was also followed by the work in the harvard by alan johnson and alan davison who introduced technetium myocardial perfusion agents that is this is positive complex and this is neutral complex and uh, missouri also have the other radio pharmaceutical the missouri radio pharmaceutical which is called the samarium edtmp this is also a very uh, good discovery or good invention that a complex of a beta emitting isotope can be used for bone pain palliation that is you know the trip the people who have cancer they get after the cancer is there they do have this uh, bone pa pa pain due to bone metastasis so this uh, uh, medicine was uh, prepared and uh, was developed at the university of missouri in 1985 86 and uh, 87 i had reached there and unfortunately dr troutner had got colon cancer uh, colon cancer and he was one of the early recipients of uh, samarium 153 edtmp another radio pharmaceutical important development is uh, the use of uh, somatostat uh, somatostatin receptor imaging agent the tok peptide was used by a person in uh, netherlands called krenning and uh, starting the uh, peptide receptor imaging followed by a peptide receptor radionuclide therapy by using the isotope yttrium now if you look into the uh, nuclear medicine department there are the two three things what the most of the therapy what they are doing is either for treating the neuroendocrine tumors with lutetium lutetium or id131 for cancer so the peptides are peptides were really a very promising carrier molecules which was introduced by a uh, craning in uh, 1992 and uh, the entry of lutetium uh, was uh, i don't really know when it entered but the the, the patent uh, filed by the university of missouri had the name of uh, lutetium the had uh, indicated that lutetium will be a good isotope for therapy and uh, one of my colleagues one of my colleagues means he was a radiochemist working in bhabha atomic research center as part of his uh, msc thesis he did actually prepared this lutetium 177 no carrier added lutetium 177 by irradiating ytterbium uh, natural ytterbium of course when he was discussing with me i was not very uh, encouraging this uh, research at that time because i at the, that was the time when i was working on therapeutic radio nucleides and i was looking at the isotope that can be prepared with a very large cross section 
uh, i was working on rhenium at that time rhodium rhenium holmium uh, ytterbium these all have very large cross section so i was more interested in that and this person made this uh, non carrier rad at uh, lutetium and though it was a very paper which was published in uh, radio analytical chemistry articles this particular paper has got very good uh, citation we did our first irradiation of natural lutetium in uh, druva reactor in uh, um, 1998 that was the time when i was heading the radio pharmaceutical section at the baba atomic research center so india is one of the earliest to enter into the lutetium radionuclide therapy the discovery of uh, the, <coughs> the fusion of uh, pet and ct by david townsend and the ronald nut was uh, another uh, very good uh, uh, invention or very good development and the first commercial pet ct was in the market in 2001 now do you know how many pet cts are there in india we have nearly 300 pet cts in india which had come in the last uh, 20 years india had our first medical cyclotron in 2002 and we started doing um, imaging a pet imaging no we didn't have a pet ct at that time pet imaging in 2002 in 2000 the another important discovery which had uh, important development was actually the introduction of germanium gallium generator into nuclear medicine and uh, in last 7 or 10 year 10 years another important thing in nuclear medicine is entry of psma inhibitor molecules for pet imaging you know we were using earlier rachilates then we were using peptides and this was the first time an inhibitor molecule was used for imaging a cancer imaging as a pharmacophore for, uh, for radio pharmaceutical and of course this was again um, the work of nearly 10 years you know a group in mayo mayo has done a lot of good work in this and in 2010 uh, we have actinium 225 therapy many of our colleagues are doing actinium 225 therapy and uh, the nuclear medicine is uh, growing fast so this i will sum it up as the history of uh, nuclear medicine and uh, a couple of nice uh, photographs so this is um, hall anger who has developed the gamma camera benedict cassen who developed this rectilinear scanner uh, i have seen this rectilinear scanner in the nuclear medicine department of uh, our retrovandram uh, regional cancer center and this is the pet ct which was uh, developed by ronald nutton uh, townsend and of course now we have this machine which is called the pet mri and the pet mri is a very expensive machine and uh, we are fortunate that we have one pet mri machine in our city that is where i am there in cochin amrutha hospital has got a pet mri the project hello yes, sir yes sir. yes sir yes sir sir hearing no it's okay no Yes sir all right okay. sir no no problem no yes sir yes sir okay we will go to the second part second part is actually radio pharma if you look at nuclear medicine there are two important things one is radio pharmaceuticals the other one is instrumentation the radio pharmaceutical has to be very good if not you don't have the image the instrument has to be very good if you don't have the if your instrument is not good you don't have the image so radio pharmaceutical and instrument agent both have the same role or equal role as far as the nuclear medicine is concerned now i will go to the radio pharmaceuticals and biprojit wanted me to tell about radio pharmaceuticals and methods of radio labeling so this is a very intricate uh, subject because uh, it cannot be sort of covered in uh, 10 or 15 minutes so i will just give an overview of the whole thing i am not going to talk about any specifics just the overview now here it is important to see what are the radio pharmaceuticals you know when you call it as a radio pharmaceutical it is an assorted 
uh, amount of materials actually the first one of course is um, the most important radioactive medicine uh, is uh, nothing but iodine 131 we use iodine 131 for therapy just we use it as a simple ion sodium iodide whether it is potassium iodide or sodium iodide it is nothing but an ion so that is the simplest of the radio pharmaceutical which you can think and this is the simplest of the radio pharmaceutical which has the most efficacious also you know no medicine will be taken uh, about 33 percent or even more uh, more by our human body but iodine is such a targeting agent whatever you are injecting a normal thyroid will take nearly 33 percent and a hyperthyroid will take more and a cancerous um, thyroid will take much more of that the second category is uh, the uh, inorganic salts you take the sodium uh, phosphate sodium phosphate is taken as uh, the radio pharmaceuticals so ions then the inorganic salts then comes the complexes all of our early radio pharmaceuticals technetium dtpa technetium hmbo for brain these are all complexes then comes actually radio labeled uh, small molecules i didn't know that that one mibg for which we use for neuroendocrine tumors we know uh, fluorine 18 fdg again it is a small molecules then comes actually the bifunctional chelating agent conjugated vectors you have the rituximab is a monoclonal antibody which is used for uh, therapy conventional therapy now if you label the uh, rituximab with yttrium 90 uh, this can be used as a radio pharmaceutical so now from here if you look at it the molecular weight of iodine 131 is uh, 131 when it comes to rituximab the antibody molecular weight is something like about 150,000. so such a large variation is there in the radio pharmaceuticals then uh, first we were working on um, radio labeling of monoclonal antibodies then uh, soon we found that you know this monoclonal antibodies have got such a large molecular weight their movement within the body is very slow so the targeting is very slow it is not very good actually there are not many monoclonal antibody labeled radio pharmaceutical in fact my postdoctoral research work was to develop rhodium monophy labeled monoclonal antibodies but it did not go too far then in 1990s came the peptides uh, lutetium dotatite is one of the peptides then the inhibitor based molecules then uh, this is the first one was our uh, a PSMA, prostate specific membrane antigen inhibit. That is an enzyme, a molecule that inhibits that enzyme. And similarly, now we have the fatty peptides which are coming. Fibrinoplast activation peptide inhibitors are coming. And I am sure many more radio pharmaceuticals using inhibitors will be coming in future because you know our entire body works on enzymes. There are a large number of enzymes in our body and these inhibitors are already used in large scale in uh, conventional drugs and it will not be too much of time from now onwards where the radio pharmaceutical scientists will be taking these inhibitors and trying to develop newer and newer uh, radio pharmaceuticals. Then we have the particulates, the sulfur colloids, the microspheres, these are particles so the size is very large. So when you talk about the radio labeling of radio pharmaceuticals, this is a very assorted subject. Each one, we need to take a particular radio pharmaceutical and need to talk about the radio labeling of that particular radio pharmaceutical. Say be it a technetium a DTPA, then we will have to start talk about complex agent, we will have to talk about uh, coordination complexes and other things. And when you talk about um, FDG, you have to talk, uh, talk for uh, fluorination reactions. So I will uh, put it this way, when you talk about radio labeling, depends on the radioisotopes. We have a large number of radio, radioisotopes. Uh, the SPECT, the most important radioisotope what we use nowadays is the technetium-99. In the 1980s, we had this uh, gallium-67, indium, iodine-123, thallium. These are the isotopes which are made using the high energy cyclotron. A 30 MeV cyclotron is useful more for making these four isotopes and unfortunately these isotopes are not used nowadays much in nuclear medicine because you have an alternative either by using uh, technetium or by using 
fluorine 18 or by gallium. So the importance of these four isotopes has definitely come down. So in uh, for pets, uh, the major isotopes are actually fluorine 18, the gallium, C11, nitrogen 13, oxygen 15, uh, uh, copper 64. There are several isotopes. But if you go to a nuclear medicine department, these are the only two isotopes which are used. It is the fluorine 18 and uh, gallium 68. The labeling chemistry of fluorine is different. The labeling chemistry of gallium is different. Now, when you talk about isotope for therapy, we have adenone 31, which is a halogen. Lutetium is a radiometal. Yttrium is a radiometal. And actinium 225, the alpha emitter is a radiometal. And these radiometals have very different properties. And hence, the chemistry will be very different. You will have to develop the individual chemistry. Now, when it comes to the <coughs> carrier molecules, here again, we have a lot of variation. We have the small molecules, the smallest molecule, they like MIBG is there, inhibitors, PSMA, API. Then you have the peptides. It can be anywhere between 8 to 15 amino acids or even a bit more. Then we have the antibodies. Then isotopes are different. We have the halogens, we have the metals. So it is important to develop a specific chemistry and very little generalization in is possible. When you tell, tell me to talk about radio labeling in 15 or 30 minutes, this is an impossible task. So this is the generality about the radio labeling. Now, how do you do the radio labeling? See, the chemist always think about the molecule. You know, when you uh, when I am preparing a fluorine 18 labeled glucose, I will all hear that, you know, that uh, chair um, structure or the circular structure or the linear structure of glucose molecule will come in my mind. And then you start thinking about how to label this one. But can you uh, do directly labeling it? Can you need, you need to add a bifunctional chelating agent to do it? And this is how the radio pharmaceuticals had emerged. The radio pharmaceuticals has emerged thanks to the chemist who thought about it. Okay, this I can take it. This molecule could be a good pharmacophore, either simply as a pharmacophore or however, once it is made complex with technetium, it could be used as the radio pharmaceuticals. So chemists played a very big role in uh, radio pharmaceutical development. Now, the type of radio labeling, the halogenations, the iodination, the fluorination, and the radio metal labeling, we have the complex formation using chelates and the metals as it rolled, the metals belong to different um, groups in the periodic table. And even if the, uh, they are in the same group, like technetium and 99M and rhenium 188, the chemistry is very different. You will, somebody, you know, initially when we started working with the rhenium, we used to say that, oh, what is the problem? We can just um, do the same technetium chemistry. But when you really start uh, working with rhenium, you know that it cannot be done that way. You know, it is very different. For example, the technetium 99G crystals of HMPO is made. But every, every chemist in university, every radio chemist in university, including myself, tried to make a technetium 99 rhenium, uh, sorry, a rhenium HMPO all of us tried because we wanted to make rhenium HMPO and do a crystal structure. None of us could do it. But I have made a certain um, amine phenol ligands with the technetium 99 and the extra crystal structures were deduced. But I could change the chemistry and make the rhenium crystals. So the chemistry is very different when it comes to uh, individual radio metals. When it comes to halogenations, halogenation, that is either putting ID-123, ID-131 or um, fluorine, halogens form a covalent bond with uh, covalent bonds and uh, there is no general principle of halogenation. Your simplicity is actually saturating a double bond, then uh, we can add a halogen to a phenol ring. You know, this was my first radiochemistry in my life. I, I, I was given the task of developing the radio immunoassay of a hormone called triiodothyroidine. And when I had to develop this hormone, my first thing was that I need to make a radioactive triiodothyroidine or T3. So what I have done is that I took this molecule T3 and tried to do an exchange labeling first. 
okay, the specific activity of the complex was less. Then I took uh, what is called the T2, that is one iodine, another iodine here, but no iodine here. And I added an iodine to this uh, T2 and made it T3. And that is how the first radio immunoassay of triodothorin in India was developed by, at that time, by me, and which went into the market. So this was my, my first radiochemistry in my life, doing a radio iodination. And when it comes to fluorine, earlier they, we used to do the electrophilic fluorination using F2 gas, and now we do the nucleophilic fluorination. So this, I will not go to the details. This is what we do every day in our um, laboratory and our cyclotron center. We have this um, manose triflate. We have uh, this OH, the, in, this is the glucose molecule. The glucose molecule, the hydroxyl groups are protected and uh, the hydroxyl group in the sixth position is substituted with the trifluorate. And then we do an SN2 reactions and you get fluorinated uh, manose triflate or glucose triflate. Then you do a um, hydrolysis and you get FDG. So this is how you do the chemistry of FDG production. And when it comes to radiometal labeling, technetium labeling or lutetium uh, labeling, <clears throat> the chemistry has to be developed based on the understanding of the metallic properties. The technetium uh, property is different, rhenium is different, gallium is different. When it comes to uh, yttrium is different, lutetium is different. All may use DOTA as the chelating agent, but DOTA is not the best chelating agent for uh, gallium. It may be a good chelating agent for lutetium, but it is not a good chelating agent for actinium-225. So there is a role for the development of newer radio, newer uh, bifunctional chelating agents. If you know, many of you who are working in the nuclear medicine department, you know that our uh, gallium PSMA can be made very nicely. The complexation will be very good. The batches don't fail. That the reason is they are using actually a uh, amine phenol ligand called HPEDCC, which has got an equilibrium constant of 10 power 37, whereas with the DOTA, it may be hardly about 10 power 21. So that in-depth knowledge in the coordination chemistry is essential to develop radiopharmaceutical chemistry with uh, knowledge. And also we need to know the biological behavior, of the biological uh, behavior essential because if you take a pharmacophore, you try to add a radio metal, and if the pharmacophore is not going to work, it is not going to be a radio pharmaceutical. See, I have seen uh, in one of the conferences and one of the person coming from the USA, she was presenting a paper to make, um, um, I think, fluorine labeled, um, this uh, fluorine labeled um, PSMA inhibitor by adding aluminum to the aluminum fluoride actually labeling that was that will not work because you know the moment you do that the pharmacophore is not going to go and sit into the uh, uh, sit into the enzyme because you know the enzyme has to bind the pharmacophore has to bind with the zinc in the one so when you look at technetium also you have this technetium complexes the hmbo which i have told and the trodat, these two are different. You see here, uh, one molecule of HMBO is complex with the technetium. Here, six molecules of MIBI is complex with the technetium. And here, we are using a bifunctional chelating agent for complexing this uh, trodat. This is nothing but your um, uh, <clears throat> cocaine. The cocaine to the cocaine, you add this uh, N2S2 ligand to do the radio labeling. So what do we need in the nuclear medicine department? The nuclear medicine department, we need uh, good images because the nuclear medicine physician, he is going to come finally to sit in the monitor and he is going to look at the images and there won't be any smile in his face if the radio pharmaceutical is bad. So when you do the radio pharmaceutical chemistry, when you do the nuclear medicine technology, the chemistry has to be very nicely understood Otherwise, you are going to land in problem and your patients are not going to be getting the information what is needed from the chemistry. Nowadays, I am afraid that a lot of hospitals, uh, places, 
people are simply following some given protocol by some commercial companies for making lutetium um, based radio pharmaceuticals not sure whether they are purifying it or not but those things the patients are spending a lot of money but ultimately the benefit need not be to the extent what it will be coming when you are injecting a very good radio pharmaceutical so i think i will uh, <coughs> Project, it's about uh, 40 minutes now. How much time I have now? Sir, um, sir 10, 10 minutes more, sir. 10 minutes more. So I'm coming to the last part of it. I, uh, the, it is the setting up the cyclotron facility at uh, Cochin and uh, its impact in nuclear medicine field in Kerala. This is the title again, uh, the subtitle what Viprojit had given. Viprojit is my latest uh, colleague in our, my, our center. So I have to listen to him. So this is my post-retirement work. I, I had worked at the Baba Atomic Research Center uh, till 2013. And um, maybe another two years or little more, I could have worked there because I was uh, offered an extension. But at that time, I decided that uh, I need to come back to my stage because and uh, I had sort of uh, given my word to a, a, a group that I will be coming back and helping them in setting up a medical cyclotron. And why that need? So this is the map of India. You know, we have something like uh, 3000 kilometer from uh, Jammu Kashmir to Kanyagumari and another 3000 kilometer from uh, Bombay to maybe, uh, maybe Gujarat to Assam or Meghalaya or whatever it is. India is a large country and if you look at this large country, we are going to use this FTG for PET imaging of oncology. And where are our cyclotrons? We have actually six cyclotrons in uh, Delhi. And another uh, 100 kilometer away, 100 or 150 kilometer away, there are two more cyclotrons. So about say, eight uh, cyclotrons are in uh, Delhi and Chandigarh. Three are there in uh, Bombay. Another three are in Bangalore. And the rest of the country, if you look at it, there, there is hardly any cyclotron. And if a patient in Madhya Pradesh wants to have a PET imaging, he has to either go to Delhi, he has to come to Bombay, or he has to come to Calcutta. And that was also the case in Kerala. We didn't have a cyclotron till the molecular cyclotron was set up in Cochin by our uh, group. So out of the 22 cyclotrons, um, uh, ours probably is the last but one. Now the story of our cyclotron is like this. We have this uh, Dr. Rajit Joy. He is a nuclear medicine uh, physician. He did his uh, DRM from uh, radio, uh, radiation medicine center. He has set up a nuclear medicine department in Kerala. Probably that was one of the, the, the first private nuclear medicine department in Kerala. He had set it up. And his father was actually the owner of a group of uh, pathology laboratories. And he had got cancer somewhere in 2011. And he had to repeatedly go to Bangalore for doing this. He was uh, going to, I think uh, Bangalore, he was going to HCG to do this uh, PET imaging. I think some choline imaging was done, FDG imaging was done. So. It was there his idea, Dr. Ajit Joy's idea, that we need a cyclotron in Kerala so that our patients or our um, family members or our patients or our public will have access to nuclear medicine and pet imaging in Kerala. Not nuclear medicine, pet imaging, more specifically pet imaging in Kerala. And uh, these are our uh, investors. We have uh, Dr. Uh, we have uh, Matthew Francis, sir. We have uh, Dr. Adhan Kunyi, Mibu. These are Qatar-based investors, Qatar-based um, businessmen. They were happy to invest in this project. And this was our uh, vision of the project. This was called the Molecular Multi-Speciality Hospital. This is in, uh, in Ernakulam. It's about uh, three, four kilometers from the uh, um, um, Ernakulam Marine Drive. And this building is in the final stage of, uh, of course, this is the artist view, but the, the, currently it is almost the same. And we have the cyclotron, uh, the molecular cyclotron already sitting there uh, in this place. So <clears throat> when we started our uh, cyclotron uh, center, in Kerala, we had a single uh, pet center. 
and we were thinking that you know it is a pet ct is such an expensive equipment you know 8 to 10 crores how many people are going to put it so we, we had a lot of discussion i had the idea to put the ge a cyclotron because you know the rmc cyclotron where i was also in the part of the project that was a ge cyclotron i was uh, happy to put a 16.5 mv cyclotron but the businessmen they always think you know you know let us have the less amount of money and put the facility and it was a very right decision that we are going to have only maybe five or six pet centers will be coming in the kerala in the next 10 years so the 11 mv siemen cyclotron we have developed and this is our cyclotron which is uh, nicely sitting in our uh, bunker this is the cyclotron these are the self shields which moves and it can be closed and uh, setting up a cyclotron is not an easy job it's a very difficult job the cyclotron um, and needs a lot of uh, services all the services like hvac services you know chill water gases so many things are needed and it just cannot be done by a chemist so we had one of our wonderful engineer who was working in baba atomic research center who retired along with me he joined us and uh, he was instrumental or he was mainly doing all this um, big job you know putting this um, uh, um, this is our uh, bunker this is you know this is this is the closure of the bada plug of the bunker it it weighs 18000 kilograms and the cyclotron was introduced to the bunker then uh, finally you uh, the cyclotron comes in the container this is taken into the through the roof to the bunker and after everything is put we close the bunker you know and once everything is closed you know the cyclotron everything looks very very simple and nice this is our uh, control room this is uh, where our medical physicist and the cyclotron operator is sitting and uh, uh, making radio pharmaceuticals uh, they are operating the cyclotron and uh, this is our uh, hot cells and i can boast and say that you know this is the best hot cells you will you will see anywhere in india these hot cells are supplied by one gallon wonderful hot cells we have actually four inch um, lead shielded uh, hot cells everything you do it by remote chemistry and uh, this is uh, a gmp control that is good manufacturing practices we have a class c laboratory and we have a class a dispensing hot cell the radio pharmaceutical will be dispensed and it will come in this sort of uh, containers and it will be going to the packing room and these are our uh, synthesis modules we have an explorer where we can do four uh, batches uh, uniform four batches consecutively and we also have other two modules which is called the neptis modules and these modules can be used for making fde and other radio pharmaceuticals and uh, in cyclotron the radiation safety is a very important aspect so what we do is that you know all the gases which are formed during synthesis will be collected in these tanks and after about um, 16 hours this uh, gas will, uh, will be released automatically to the atmosphere that means we don't discharge any radioactivity to the atmosphere and uh, this is our uh, quality control laboratory we have a, a tlc um, sorry a tlc scanner here a gas chromatograph we have the bet and uh, we do all the quality control uh, testing here and this is the packaging and dispatching room we, this is the finished product which is going to go to the uh, going on to go to the nuclear medicine centers and if we talk about uh, good manufacturing practices in good manufacturing practices the four pillars are actually the premise equipment personal and the documentation see you can put lot of money and build a very nice premise you can put lot of money and buy the best equipment but the most crucial factor is to have the good personnel and uh, my philosophy in setting up this electron center and developing the manpower was i have decided that i will be taking the highest qualified people only for doing the chemistry because i don't want the mechanical chemistry to be done i really want to when they are doing a glucose labeling i really want to look. in their mind it should come the glucose molecule should come these are all msc students uh, this is our center manager who is called uh, ravi ravi he is a very good chemist 
these two are our um, cyclotron uh, physicists they also do the chemistry and uh, this four boy this is a radio pharmacy person he is a b farm and uh, these three are msc chemists so it's always good in investing in people because these are the people who have to do the science during night because you know our uh, radio pharmaceutical work starts uh, taking place at um, 10 o'clock in the night and we finish uh, probably by about 6 o'clock and all our packets have gone to different hospitals and uh, the doctors are ready to do the imaging from maybe 6:30 or 7 o'clock so when you talk about the impact of the, our medical cycle run see when we started there was a single uh, radio isotope uh, radio uh, nuclear medicine center having a pet city in ernakulam our own center we had put a pet city in uh, trivandrum so these were the only two and by now there are uh, 14 pet city centers in uh, kerala we have uh, three four pet centers in uh, coimbatore there is one which had come in uh, tamil nadu adjacent to kerala so already we are catering to nearly about um, 15 or 16 hospitals and in kerala we are going to have many many more uh, pet Uh, CT where nuclear medicine centers having pet CT. So the number of this pet CT, if you look at the whole of India, the number of pet CT per million people, ours will be the best, and this will be not at least half of what they have in the United States. Now, what is the impact this uh, medical sector on has done to Kerala? This is what Biprojit uh, wanted to know. till now we have made about 1500 batches of um, fluorin 18 something like about 90000 to 1 lakh curies we made about 50000 curie of fdg of course you know most of the fdg will uh, decay because you know this has to travel to different distances to our half life and at least about uh, 75000 to 100000 patients would have got benefited in kerala thanks to molecular cyclotron when we started there were only two centers now there are 14 centers in kerala and maybe in another 5 years this will be doubling into 28 to 30 centers the important thing is the cost of the radio pharmaceutical has come down to half because we were buying radio pharmaceutical fdg from bangalore we were paying 55000 50 to 55000 for 100 millicuri and now from our center we are giving anywhere from 25 to 30000 is the cost depending upon where the nuclear medicine centers are there and the pet ct in kerala is one of the lowest the pet ct is then anywhere between 15000 to 20000 this is one of the lowest in the world and probably one of the lowest even in india and uh, the more important thing is the patient comfort increase as pet ct is available in the nearby city You know, you travel fifty to a hundred kilometers. You have the pet CT centers. In fact, you can select. You know, there are three or four pet CT centers in uh, some places. Say like Cochin, people coming. There are five pet CT centers in Calicut. There are three in Trivandrum. There are three. So people can select. You know, which pet CT center you can go. That was not the case. The people had to take the appointment, the prayer appointments with Bangalore or Bombay, TMH. and they go by flight there they take a couple of um, people along with them so the cost was very high now the cost has come down the patients are happy and the doctors are happy so one of the question in a lot of our nuclear medicine um, uh, youngsters ask me uh, the public ask me is that is it safe to work with radioactivity you know there is a um, this worry is always there whenever somebody has to go for a you know they will go for and work in a pet city in a city no problem but when it comes to a pet city where the radiation dose which is coming from pet is less than that is coming from pt people are afraid people are afraid of radioactivity so i always tell them you know look most of the elements had been most of the transuranium elements uh, the plutonium americium curium berkelium californium ncd ncnium fermium mendelievian nobilium and seaborgium was discovered by this gentleman called uh, glen seaborg he was atomic energy commission chairman of uh, the united states and i am sure as a physicist as a chemist as a laboratory person he would have handled a lot of radioactivity of course with care not without care with a lot of care he would have taken and he would have definitely handled lot of radioactivity and he had a full life of 87 years 
Now, I have a small link with uh, Glenn Seberg. Glenn Seberg student was uh, Dr. A.C. Wall who worked in the Washington University. And uh, I did my postdoctoral research with David Troutner, who is the inventor of uh, technetium HMBO and the samarium EDTMP. And the first man to say that lutetium is a good therapeutic radionuclide. And uh, he was the student of uh, Dr. A.C. Wall, who is the student of uh, Glenn Seberg. And I am the student of uh, Tr um, David Troudner. So I can almost say that, you know, my I have a lineage coming from uh, Glenn Seberg to through AC Wall to do Dr. David Troudner to myself. And I'm fortunate to be claiming that here. So this is my last side. Anything in life, you know, there are three things which matter. The curiosity, the talent and practice. This is true for radiochemistry. This is true for um, uh, um, um, nuclear medicine. This is true for technology. Anything what we do in life, we should have, have the enthusiasm. Enthusiasm like a small child. Look at this small child. This is a picture which I picked up from uh, National Geographic. Look at this small child, you know. The world is existing for millions of years, but the child is seeing it for the first time and anything and everything that child is curious to know. Then comes actually the talent should be there. Not that everybody can become a musician or everybody can become a, a actor or everybody can become a scientist. There has to be some inborn talent. And uh, then you need to practice it. You know, no chemistry will be done unless you get out of your uh, sitting bench, go to the lab, take the test tube, take the chemicals and keep doing, keep doing, keep doing. So unless you put a lot of practice, Things will not work, even if you have talent and even if you have curiosity. So curiosity, talent and practice what is, is what is important. And uh, to end my uh, presentation, this is a beautiful actress called Sobana. And uh, see the way in which she is uh, balancing. The entire weight is put in a small toe. And this is possible because the talent is there and she is also practiced it. So that's the uh, end of it. So I have a website which is uh, which is in the Academia website. I'm sure you know some of you would have seen it. If you have not seen it, probably it may be worth looking at it. I have I put all my talks and all I put all my papers in the Academia site. Uh, there are about 1363 as of today uh, scientists across the world following my Academia website. And I have about um, uh, nearing 50,000 uh, views in it. And uh, my publication can also be seen in the Google Scholar if you put uh, MRF live. So with this, I will uh, stop my talk. Thank you very much. I hope all the people whom I saw first um, logged in, they are all still with me. Thank you. Thank you, Akash. I'm done. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. Uh, before I could uh, go to the concluding remarks, uh, there are a few questions uh, that we would like to uh, ask you. So can we proceed with that? Yeah. Shall I stop the uh, sharing? Sure, sir. How do I do that? Uh, uh, you can click on that uh, stop sharing. Sir. End the show. Am I still uh, seen? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Sir, uh, first question uh, you have mentioned about uh, enzyme inhibitors uh, going to be uh, the pharmacophores in future. So how does it uh, compare? How does the enzyme inhibitor radiopharmaceutical going to compare with antibodies? Antibody labeled radiopharmaceuticals. I mean, sorry. Yeah, this is a very nice question. I should say this is asked by whom? Uh, I'm only uh, Rakesh. Sir. Rakesh. Rakesh, you know, uh, anything what we use it as a radiopharmaceutical, we once you are injecting in the body through an intravenous injection or by orally when you are giving it, it should go into the target at the earliest. So when you use antibody, the antibody has got a biological half-life of several uh, several days. It has got a molecular weight of 150,000. It will keep moving through the bloodstream and it will be taken up by the target very, very slowly. That is why, you know, when you want to do a radio labeling of 
antibodies, we always look at isotope which has got a half life of at least about uh, three to four days. You know that was the reason why I have, I have done a lot of work with uh, rhodium one oh five thirty five hour half life. So we were thinking that you know iodine, rhodium, etc. will be a very good uh, choice for making antibody labeling. Now, when it comes to peptide, yeah, pe so not peptide. When it comes to inhibitor, the inhibitor molecules can have. You know, you look at uh, PSM inhibitor. This is nothing but two amino acids joined through a, a urea bridge. And to that, you can add actually about the fluorine without any bifunctional chelating agent or anything. So the radiopharmaceutical molecular weight of a fluorine labeled PSM inhibitor will be hardly 200. Now, if you put a 200 molecular weight radiopharmaceutical into your body, this will move very fast in the bloodstream and wherever it has to be absorbed, where it, wherever there is a target, either it will go to the target or it will be excreted through the kidneys very, very fast. Now, if you look at a PMA, PSMA scan, have you look? Have you seen a PSMA scan? The PSMA scan is so clean, the whole body will be seen like transparent, but the prostate cancer will be seen very nicely, the lacrimal glands will be seen very nicely. So, the, only the targets will be taking up and rest of the things will be taken up, they are relieved very fast. Now, this will not happen when you use a monoclonal antibody. A monoclonal antibody is a big molecule. It will go, part of it will go into the um, tumor, but the remaining will be still lingering in the blood till it is removed by the liver. It is not removed by the kidneys. It will be removed by the liver and whatever has to be removed by the liver, it takes more time. So this is the essential difference. What we want is the radiopharmaceuticals which are having low molecular weight so that the targeting is very high and the non-specific targeting is very slow so that you get a very good signal to uh, background ratio is very good you get very good suv values and at the same time the radiation dosimetry is very good and uh, the same is the case with the therapy when you are using therapy the an inhibitor based molecule will go into the tumor very fast and the rest of the body will be clean so there will be maximum radiation dose to the tumor and very little radiation dose to the blood or rest of the organs. So that's the essential difference. Sir, next question. Yes, sir, it's uh, completely clear, sir. Next question, sir. Uh, nowadays, we see in the therapeutic radio uh, uh, nuclear medicine, we see lutetium-177 as more popular. So what has made it uh, more popular than I-131? I mean, with the chemistry perspective, I think uh, I-131 radio pharmaceuticals are easy to work or uh, it is said like it is easy to label than uh, any other uh, uh, radionuclide. So what has shifted the paradigm that lutetium-177 is more focused and is uh, uh, on the leading edge? Yeah, you if you look at it, uh, lutetium and uh, ID-131, uh, look at the physical property. The physical properties are almost the same. The half-life is how much for iodine? Half-life for iodine is eight, hour, eight days. Lutetium is also eight days. Look at the beta ray, beta um, um, uh, um, component of iodine. The energy of um, iodine is um, very similar to that of lutetium. Lutetium is little lower, but the energy of iodine is very similar to that of uh, iodine and lutetium beta particles. They are very similar. Now, the third thing what you look at is the gamma component. Now, when in a therapeutic uh, radio pharmaceutical, we want, we don't want gammas. We don't want gammas. Now, if you look at the, um, the amount of gammas, what is present in uh, lutetium, lutetium hardly has got about 11% gamma and that gammas are actually very low energy gammas, 111 keV and uh, 206 keV. The total percentage is 11. Whereas if you look at it, ID-131, the percentage gamma may be almost coming to nearly 100%. So you are having the gammas which you don't need it along with iodine. Whereas in lutetium, you don't have it. So what's the advantage? You can give lutetium to a patient, keep the path, you can give 150 milligram of lutetium to a patient, keep the patient for maybe five to six hours uh, into the clinic, 
allow the the actually the lute the whatever lutetium which has not gone to the tumor to be excreted from the body of the patient and the patient can be discharged because there is not much of radiation which will be harmful to rest of the people when this patient who has got lutetium moves around in the society now this is not the case with id 131 id 131 when it is injected to the patients <clears throat> The amount of gamma present is so large that the patient, the iodine, iodine patient will have lot of radiation dose outside. Now the second one, another thing, what you look is that if you give take lutetium, the lutetium even if it is coming out as a uh, as a dotted or whatever it is, if the lutetium is coming out, the lutetium will be most of it will be getting excreted. Whereas iodine one thirty one, the moment if there is a dehalogenation of iodine one thirty one, iodine has a, got a very long biological half life in the body. The biological half life is nearly one thirty seven, one twenty seven days. So the physical half life of iodine will that is whatever iodine which will be deiodinated it will be lingering in the body till all the activity gets decayed in the body. So the radiation dosimetry of lutetium is far superior to <coughs> iodine. And then of course um, you know you can make very nice radio pharmaceuticals with lutetium and probably that you can do with iodine also. The chemistry chemistry is in the hands of uh, chemists like us. So, is that convincing? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, it's sir. Uh, really yes, convincing. Sir, uh, uh, the one more question. So, we have uh, had a visit to medical cyclotron uh, developed by VECC. So, they have this uh, gallium 67, I1 triple 1, and uh, iodine 123, indium triple 1, iodine 123, and thallium 201 uh, radiochemistry modules. But as we see nowadays, uh, as you have already also mentioned, like these uh, radionucleides or their radio pharmaceuticals are not widely used nowadays. So, what has gone wrong? Uh, didn't we predict correctly, or what is going to be the fate of uh, such a big project? Akash? Yes. Who asked this question? Sir, these are my questions. I mean, we have compiled from our batchmates. Akash, uh, you know, that's a project which has gone in the wrong direction. I don't want to uh, get into a comment that, you know, because I'm an ex-atomic uh, energy man. I will not, uh, okay. you know, this will be recorded and uh, yes. definitely it will be going around, you know. Yes. But uh, one of the important things which I had been suggesting to the VECC people as well as to the department is that we have this um, uh, 30 MeV cyclotron and we need germanium gallium generator. We don't we, we don't need gallium 68 which is directly produced because I believe that a 68 minute half-life isotope cannot be moved to multiple places. So that will not serve the purpose. It will serve the purpose. What you need is actually a germanium gallium generator. And the 30 MeV cyclotron is the best one. Now what a 30 MeV cyclotron is what is needed for making germanium 68 as the raw material for making uh, gallium. So I will put it this way that you know if the department uh, uh, remodels the, their program to make um, germanium 68, it will be a wonderful thing to happen to the nuclear medicine uh, faculty in India. Unfortunately, what had happened is that, you know, we were wanting this 30 MeV cyclotron maybe somewhere in 1975 onwards, actually. I remember, you know, my colleague Ramurthy was at that time working with cyclotron and he used to be uh, every five year program, which used to come from uh, 1975 onwards, we used to tell that we need a 30 MeV cyclotron at that time. What was decided was that, you know, okay, you know, a 30 MeV cyclotron can be made in India. Let us not buy it. Let us not buy it. But this went up to about the 2000s. And then when we decided already gallium in the Indian gallium, um, the thallium, they were out. And unfortunately that uh, cyclotron project also, which uh, I, I, I believe that the cyclotron had come to India somewhere in 2004, now 16 or 17 years are over and uh, it is still in the uh, initial stages only. So I, the best thing to do with that medical cyclotron, with, with that 30 MeV cyclotron is to make germanium. And there is a big demand for germanium, not only in India, the whole world. And they can make abundant amount of uh, 
germanium from that uh, cyclotron i hope they uh, this message i had been giving it uh, in multiple places they had invited me about three years back to give a lecture there in um, vecc that time i have projected this work and um, i had been mentioning the department and when i was uh, there also so no sir, uh, sir uh, yes sir thank you sir uh, for clarifying that uh, then one more question sir what how it is going to be the battle between fdg and uh, fapi so is it like uh, fapi is going to replace it or like uh, what are we looking at with fapi see fapi is a wonderful molecule having uh, whatever what all i have read it i read a paper where it shows that about 28 more 28 different cancers can be um seen with done with it no isn't it yes yeah, sir, yes sir. The, the paper you know somebody had published 28 different cancers and there are several cancers which has got actually um good suvs for uh, better suvs than fdg for um, with the fapi there are cancers which has got uh, less suv than with fapi so the role of fdg will not vanish according to me the fdg will be definitely will be used but fapi is going to be a useful molecule but that need not be again you know the fapi what is um, the gallium fapi it can be the uh, f18 fapi you know it will not be too much time before we start making f18 fapi or uh, a similar type of molecules the role of fdg might come down might not come down but Uh, the role of fluorine 18 acid will not come down because you know you know the I mean it is far easy to get um, f18 can be you know you can make about in our own cyclotron you do it is 11 mv cyclotron we make a, a curie of activity in a, a single batch and that much if uh, the generator the maximum generator what we used to buy is actually 50 mv curie you know so f18 will have a big role but fapi definitely is a very wonderful molecule i had been looking to get it and in fact i have got my first shipment of fapi from a commercial company you know we look forward to do some studies uh, with that yeah. and not only fapi you know there will be many more uh, you know somebody who uh, the radio chemist working radio pharmaceutical division their radio pharmaceutical program Uh, they should they very seriously look at uh, inhibitor molecules as uh, pharmacophore ready pharmaceutical maybe if i was um, 30 years younger i would have been searching all the studying all the enzymes uh, to see you know which is the next molecule to be labeled you know? yes sir sir last question uh, i would like to uh, ask so uh, as you have already ex uh, uh, excellently explained that uh, in kerala it took such long like uh, almost you are the first uh, uh, group to start the cyclotron so in india it's the same with uh, many places so what are the factors uh, that are limiting in india wide availability of uh, nuclear medicine practices so see putting a cyclotron is a very big job it is not an easy job to put cyclotron it needs a very big uh, team work you know so for example uh, i had joined with this group they were <coughs> they were uh, wanting me to uh, set the cyclotron but i was fortunate that you know i have got a good engineer uh, along with me from brc together we could do it so set uh, you know you can put a pet set uh, almost very easily you know you buy the instrument and you tell the company who is putting it they will do it now when it comes to cyclotron the thing is like you know you will have to interact with arb you have to get a site clearance you will have to get a uh, <coughs> psar clearance preliminary safety analysis report <coughs> then you will have to get a final safety analysis report then you will have to do this construction and the, the amount of service is what is needed for cyclotron you know The amount of gas, the number of gases needed, the electricity needed, <coughs> the chilled water needed, HVAC needed. The humidity is such an important uh, aspect. If the humidity is not all right, the your cyclotron will work, not work. You know, so it is not a easy job to put a cyclotron. Then the question is actually the cost factor. The putting the cost factor is something like about uh, here. Yeah. <coughs> we started thinking about our uh, second machine 
and um, the project cost is almost coming to about 35 to 45 35 to 45 crores it will come for a 18 mb cyclotron with a higher beam current and uh, higher beam current now somebody to invest uh, that much of money to a to a business new business it is difficult they will think that you know why should i put that 35 crores into a, an unknown business why not i put it for something else you know so the number of people who will come forward to put the cyclotron are limited a lot of people are happy to put the pet ct you know at the moment there is a <coughs> the fdg available doctors are willing to you know, buy a pet ct and put it but they will not venture into the cyclotron you know and uh, the issues are much more much more complex complicated you need a uh, very good engineering knowledge is needed you need uh, very good um, chemistry knowledge is needed you will have to develop the um, you will have to develop the people so as a project it is a, it's a very challenging one actually i remember our project back in the brc when we were uh, first putting our uh, medical cyclotron in rmc our team used to be uh, the core team used to be something like about 10 or 12 of, 12 of us and then each uh, core team like chemistry used to have some other people then radiation protection used to have their own core group physics used to have a core group then um, engineering used to have it 30 40 people are associated with that project so that's why you know when somebody want to set up a new cyclotron the company person will come and tell you oh everything is very easy to do it you know you just buy the machine and i will advise it you know we will advise but you know you'll have to believe me the people who sell the machine are not the people who come with the machine to install the moment the selling is over the money is out of your pocket to the company's pocket these fellows don't care for the customer this is my experience so many people will not dare to put it you know see there were occasions you know we used, i used to keep my hand on the head and saying you know why did i why did i rope in this poor for people to put so much of money into this project you know so it's a difficult job actually um, rakesh you asked this question you know that you know our um, cyclotron whatever you are talking in um, actrack the discussion is going on from 2006 or 2007 onwards Okay. So, yeah. even, yes, even the department, it's a difficult project, you know. Yes. yes. So, so, yeah. Yes, sir. Thanks a lot once again for covering everything, sir. It's like a full fledged meet and what we have expected everything. So there was everything scientific, there was logistics, there was economic issues. So everything has been covered really well. And we can proudly say like uh, we are uh, with our objectives with this session and we would uh, really like to take this forward as it is with uh, raising the bar even more higher. I would like to ask and request you for more and more support and I would like to thank you a lot for doing this and I would like to thank Viprojit also for coordinating and inviting you for this uh, uh, phenomenal uh, lecture series. Now I would like to hand over this to Dr. Shomendranath Ray from Tata Medical Center, Kolkata to give concluding remarks. Thanks you sir, once again. Thank you Akash. I hand over this to Dr. Shomendranath Ray from uh, Tata Medical Center, Kolkata for concluding remarks.